music, um, it is a moment. It's a, it's a it's a thing that allows us to sort of tap into the ineffable, right? The ineffable is piercing a veil into something that we kind of can't explain but all experience. One of the things I want to be very clear about is like there are many different ways you can you can do this musically. There's not one musical tradition that's better at it or not, because that's where society and culture come in. The music is situated in its in its context, and those contexts provide meanings, and they, they reshape meanings. To pull it back a step and use this analogy of, let's say, intonation, like the, how, how notes are in tune. If we think about that from two cultural perspectives, instead of me listening to someone's music and telling them, your music is out of tune, instead, I can have a conversation with them, and I can learn about the practices of their culture that help provide some kind of context and understanding for that system of intonation, a system of how the pitches work together. And I can do the same for them, you know, back and forth. And so if you move that over to the, uh, to the context of, of a song like, like The Eyes of Texas, you have the opportunity to actually share way more than a song. You have an opportunity to share ideas about culture, ideas about who you are, ideas about who other people are, and learn these things. The problem is, is when there's a sort of a breakdown and, and there's a, a lack of willingness on either party to feel like they, that the other party has something to say about it. And this is, I think, Part of the impasse that we've we sort of found ourselves is that both halves of this equation feel that they both have the answer. My stuff is in tune, your stuff is out of tune, right? What I think we, we need to understand is that you know, both have legitimate understandings of how this song works, right? And they both feel as real as the, as the other does to the other. So when we, when we look at something like The Eyes of Texas, we're really looking at it as more of a manifestation of really deep-seated questions we have about ourselves as, uh, let's say, Americans. The song then becomes a lightning rod because people can map so much onto music that they can map these ideas about who they think they are, who they want to be, who they were, onto a few notes, when in fact, this, this song is situated in a genre. It's situated in performance practices of theater that are, um, all of which are very closely related to popular culture to this day in ways that we, quite frankly, don't want to talk about. We don't want to talk about how blackface minstrelsy um, has shaped Broadway today, right? Has shaped ABC sitcoms today, right? We don't really want to have that conversation. But instead, we can talk about a song. We can, we can all sort of argue about a song and that feels somehow disconnected. So I think this is one of the reasons why the song, uh, perhaps one of the reasons why uh, monuments, right, statues have become lightning rods instead of the conversation about what they represent. So we're right at the beginning of this conversation. We've just now started to inform people about the history of the song, about the legac legacies of uh, blackface minstrelsy that inform these earliest sort of instance of this song, right? But a lot of people think that we're at the end of that conversation already. And, and quite frankly, we aren't. We just now um, have started to fold the, this kind of information into our conversations with students on a more sort of regular basis. The issue is once people, um, if people start, start to think that we're at the end of the conversation, that we are somehow, we've solved the problem already. I've made my decision already. Either side of this com conversation, that's just, this is not really where we're at. It takes a while for people to even want to have the conversations. Then they have to learn how to have the conversations. Then they have to make mistakes and learn how to deal with those mistakes in those conversations. We're at the very beginning. We're just now telling people, oh, by the way, here's some information you need to know to make these decisions. If we refuse to confront the fact that blackface minstrelsy was a thing and a thing that existed to such an extent that it influenced popular culture on campus at UT. If we erase that, then we don't understand the, the legacies that came out of that. It's easy to explain, it's hard to accept, that blackface minstrelsy was that popular. It was very, very, very popular. So when we go back and we want to just um, cut something like the eyes of Texas off from this, it seems ridiculous to me. It seems like in a hundred years, we're going to talk about the 2000 teen and talk about popular culture and talk about popular music, but we don't want to talk about Beyonce. Like we just want to erase her from the story.
The best use of the Eyes of Texas, in my opinion, is as a tool to talk about the institutionalized legacies of, of, of uh, discrimination and segregation, legal, legal and otherwise, and racism in large institutions at the institutional level, at the state level, at the national level, both historically, presently, and in the future. If we erased it completely, that's an opportunity that we don't have going forward, to have meaningful conversations about how, how did the university participate in this international, you know, understanding of, of, of race that trickled down all the way to the, to the level of these individual performances. We can fight over the song and argue o o over the value of the song, but at the end of the day, if the only thing that changes is the song, then we've lost, right? We've really kind of lost, we've, we've lost important opportunities to move forward.